first, uh, um, Yuval, thank you for your great talk. <laughs> it was a lot of learning in it. Um, you mentioned a term, useless class. Yes. Are you serious about it? Certainly. I mean, if, certainly I don't mean useless from the viewpoint of their mother or husband or children. In this sense, no person is ever useless. I mean useless from the viewpoint of the economic system. Um, humans reaching a state like horses today, when they're basically useless. Um, and largely because of automation and artificial intelligence, being able to do almost anything better than human beings. Yeah, the thing that worries me the most is that it's not because those people are not capable of doing the work, it's that they are no longer needed, required, or wanted to do that job. That worries me a lot. In my opinion, it seems like a human being is maybe the only species that cares about the purpose of living. Mm -hmm. It's not that like I will get to starve if I don't work. I think the time of scarcity is well gone, but just living, doing nothing, living a life without purpose worries me. Oh, I don't think we should be that worried because purpose doesn't need to involve work or job. And, you know, most jobs today in the world, they are not very meaningful or, or fun. If you are a university professor, then okay. But most <laughs> people, you know, to drive a truck or to work in a textile factory uh, 10 hours a day, it's not a lot of fun. People need to do it to have, to have food, to have their subsistence. But um, I don't think people necessarily have to have a job or work in order to have purpose and meaning in life. This has been the case before. It won't necessarily be the case in the future. Got it. So, JP, what do you think? Are you worried about uh, the rise of uh, useless class? Well, since I'm here to uh, debate you well, I obviously <laughs> have to take the uh, opposite position. Um, the, um, in the beginning of the 17th century, 18th century, um, in the Industrial Revolution, people talk about machines replacing patents, millions of millions of patents. Uh, but the reality is many patents went to factory, you know, making cars, uh, driving trucks. Um, I study economics in New York, Chicago. Uh, I'm a strong believer in free market economy. The invisible head um, will fix things. Uh, we're worried uh, maybe a little bit too much about having this group of people, maybe not jobs, but well, the, the history tells us uh, the free market will evolve, uh, will create new jobs, new functions for those millions of people to do things and to be happy, hopefully. So do you, you, you think in the future there will be new things those people right. will be able to do? Well, maybe you, know, you need uh, maintenance workers to fix robots. Uh, maybe you need people to, you know, clean up the machines. Um, I don't know exactly what they are, uh, but I believe the free market, the economy, uh, will actually fix itself. So you're quite optimistic about this? I'm trying to be, at least, uh, okay. for today. <laughs> yeah, well, for today, I got that. So, um, in terms of the impact, that useless class, do you think it will be what would it mean for the human society in the future? Well, from my understanding is that if a lot of people are really being useless, it leads to problem. It leads to maybe riot. They will try to find themselves something to do. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's something it's like what they want to do or needed by the society who want them to do that. But they will find something to do. But if there's not enough job for them to do, that would be a problem. What do you think? I mean, my, I'm actually quite worried about that being a catastrophe. Well, I, I think we need to think in, in, in several levels. Mm. First of all, I agree that there is no certainty that there will be billions of people without a job. Um, the fact is nobody knows what the job market is going to look like in 30 years. Um, I am worried that uh, even though in previous cases in history people feared automation 
and there was always enough jobs, the free market always created enough jobs, there is a fear that this time it is different. Right. Uh, because previously machines competed with humans only in basically physical skills, and there were always new jobs that demand cognitive skills. Now machines are beginning to compete in cognitive skills, and we don't know of a third kind of skill that people have beyond physical and cognitive that we still have an edge over the machines. So it's different from the 19th century. And another worry is that even if there are new jobs available, would people be able to retrain themselves fast enough to gain the necessary skills? Because in the past, like you, you automated agriculture, and people moved to working in factories, in big cities. But you didn't need a lot of sophisticated skills to find a job as a worker in a factory. So if you were 30 years old and you lost your job on a farm and you moved to the city, within a couple of weeks you could find work as an unskilled laborer in some factory. Now, when people think about the new jobs of the future, they usually think about very high-skilled jobs, like computer designer or a designer of three-dimensional virtual games. Now, if I lose my job as a truck driver or textile worker, I won't have the skills, even if there is a new job. And we are not teaching many people today in the world the necessary skills uh, for finding a job in 30 years. So it's not just whether there are enough jobs, it's also whether people are able to do these jobs. Mm -hmm. So, JP, what do you think is the impact? I, I think you have to define sort of whether it's positive or negative. Organically, I would guess your answer is negative, but I may be wrong. But if it's negative, how negative it could be, like how bad it could be, what do you think? Uh, again, today I'm trying to be an uh, optimist. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think uh, I totally agree. Uh, a lot of jobs will become obsolete. Uh, the truck drivers, the taxi drivers. Uh, but you really think about it. Uh, why do you need a job? Um, well, historically, because of the scarcity of the resources, you need a job to bring food to the table, to buy stuff. But nowadays, there are so many uh, materials uh, that's not scared anymore. You can pretty much get a lot of things for free. In China, you can get free takeout. You can ride free bike. Uh, us venture capitalists obviously are paying for them. <laughs> uh, uh, but so the, the resource is becoming more and more abandoned. So maybe people don't need to work mm -hmm. to get fat, to get clothes. Um, maybe job becomes a pleasure. Working becomes a pleasure. Warren Buffett, he goes to office every single day. It, it, he so, so, you think that's, <laughs> so that's the time of communist society? Um, well, maybe. That, maybe that's <laughs> where we're going. Uh, I think you, you made a lot of references to Karl Marx. Uh, that's capital in your book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he very famously say, um, you know, the, the resources should be allocated um, to people um, according to their needs, mm -hmm. um, and people contribute according to their ability. Uh, maybe in the future, the society will evolve like that. Um, people go to work for fun. You may actually have to pay a tax in order to work, to do the job. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that this is, is possible. And two things that worry me from a historical perspective is first of all that um, whenever something becomes very cheap and abundant and everybody has it, then immediately people expand their expectations and desires. They take it for granted, they want more, and they get very angry if they don't get that something more. You look today, said in the United States, and you know, people who are unemployed, they get sometimes unemployment, they have a big, big house and a car and all the food they can eat. More people are dying from eating too much than from eating too little. Right. So you would think that everybody would be extremely satisfied and happy. Yet they are not, because they don't compare themselves to people a thousand years ago and say to themselves, oh, I have all these wonderful things that my great-grandparent didn't have. They compare themselves to the upper classes today 
and they become very envious. And the, the, my fear is that even if you have a kind of universal basic income for everybody on the planet, and nobody needs to worry about food, about basic health care, there will always be some luxuries, some scarce resources, like everybody gets a house, but only one person can live next, on, on the first house next to the beach. It, it's still scarce resources, so all the competition will be about that. And if you don't have a job, if you, ca if you can't earn money, um, so how would you compete uh, in, in, in this situation? The other problem is, as you say, um, the question of meaning. Where would people find meaning and purpose in life? And here, there are all kinds of, 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 of possibilities, including even, you know, drugs and computer games. Maybe people will have so much spare time and they don't need to work for, to work for a living and they just play computer games, not like today, but three-dimensional virtual reality computer games, which are far more exciting than anything in the outside world, certainly far more exciting than driving a taxi. Yep. So maybe Wanzhe uh, Rongyao is not really that bad, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, well, you know, happiness, it's a relative term. Um, I think, again, in your book, you talk about um, pharmaceutical uh, products that can actually provide certain chemical in your body to make you happy. Uh, in the United States, as many of you know, uh, many states have legalized marijuana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so maybe by that time, you don't need a job. Uh, well, you actually do your job in the computer game, uh, in virtual reality. Um, and then you can take a lot of uh, uh, drugs or other type of uh, chemical products to make you happy. Um, and you achieve, you find your meaning in the computer game. You can be the king uh, of order that kill everybody. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the last question on this topic is that if you happen to be, to be stuck in this useless class, or you are born to be in this class in, the future, in our future uh, generations, what will be the way out? Well, first, maybe for some, it's a fortunate thing since you don't have to do anything. Or for others, it's an unfortunate thing since you can't find anything you want to do. So what is the way out for those people who want to get out of this class? Um, I'm afraid that for most people, it might be impossible to get out of that situation. Uh, the gap between the upper class and the useless class will be too big. And it, will, it might even be a biological gap. I mean, in the past, uh, there was no biological difference between the emperor of China and the, the simplest peasant. They're both homo sapiens, and uh, you can have, you know, in a revolution, and the peasant will become the emperor, like with the Ming dynasty. Um, but in a hundred years, because of the developments of bioengineering and, and artificial intelligence, maybe there is a real biological difference. For the first time, it might be possible to translate economic inequality into biological inequality, and then you don't have the same abilities. You You're don't have the same skills. Right? Hmm? You're talking about X-Men. Not as <laughs> radical as, as X-Men, but yes, given the new potential of things like genetic engineering, things like direct brain computer interfaces, you could translate sure. economic inequality into biological inequality, and then it becomes almost impossible to transcend, to close this gap. Uh, again, I'm being optimistic. Please. Um, there <laughs> Somebody has to must be. be. <laughs> there has to be some kind of uh, upward mobility. Um, a person has to be able to uh, work hard, study hard, and maybe figure out a better algorithm um, to you know, determine uh, happiness or meaningful life uh, by you know, starting new companies, uh, new ways of doing computing, uh, new type of robotics, uh, new biological uh, parts of the body. Uh, there has to be a way uh, of people to come from uh, the bottom of the class, uh, move up 
in the society or you know, upward mobility will be an important issue. Um, I believe as long as technological advancement, newer idea, smarter people are going to create better solutions. Okay, well, that's it for this topic. Let's move to the um, next one, which is uh, about the AI safety or security issue uh, this technology may bring to us. Uh, my understanding of this issue has two folds. First one is that the AI is not reliable in terms of that, um, you know, partially due to not enough high quality data, partially due to the imperfection of algorithms. So the right to have a good AI will be very bumpy. And in the process of, process of that, what can we do to make the acceptance of AI technology a easy ride? Mm -hmm. Are we doing enough today? Well, actually, well, even before that, is that a question, a problem you actually worry about or not? I mean, for me, it's a big factor when I'm doing, um, when I'm selecting the company to invest, I care about whether those companies care about making their AI technology stable enough before rolling out into society. Mm -hmm. Of certain areas, it's less a concern, but certain areas, it's a huge concern, for example, self-driving. Yeah. So what do you think? Well, I think that in order to be accepted and in order to become a powerful force in society, AI will not need to be perfect. It will just need to be better than humans, which is not so difficult because humans are imperfect. Um, you know, for self-driving cars to replace human drivers, there will be accidents. But as long as you have significantly fewer accidents, that will be acceptable. And, you know, humans are terrible drivers. Really, I mean, in the future, people will look back and say they were crazy. They <laughs> gave humans to drive cars. That's crazy. Um, you know, every year, car accidents kill twice as many people as all violence together. You take all the people killed by war, crime, and terrorism together, it's about six to 700,000 people every year around the world. How many people are killed by car accidents? Almost 1.3 million. And most of the car accidents are not because some problem with the road, it's because some problem with the human driver. You drink alcohol and drive, or you text a message and you drive and you bump into somebody, and AI will be so much better. It will never drink alcohol and drive. So it's the relative improvement yes. that matters in this case. So Jeff, you, what do you think? Well, the, obviously, we're still quite far away uh, from true commercialization um, of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, you talk to your iPhone, hey, Siri, uh, but what can you do with it? Actually, right now, there's still very, very little you can do with Siri. Um, actually, I've been looking for a good um, dictation software. Hmm. Um, you still can't find it. I mean, I can get to maybe 90%, 95%, um, but it, it won't give you 100%. Um, I think we're still quite far away uh, from truly using artificial intelligence uh, to be a real uh, assistant uh, in our life. Um, however, uh, what I think you're talking about is security, data. Um, do I really want to tell the machine or my iPhone or Siri everything about myself? I actually don't. I don't want, you know, the machine knows all my preference, uh, all my hobbies, or pick and choose which clothes I should wear, what type of restaurant I want to go to uh, on a daily basis. Um, so in that regard, um, I think as a consumer, as a human being, we need to protect our privacy. We should not let the cloud to have all of our data. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Great. 
So given the time limit, we probably have to stop uh, right here. But I'm sure the progress of the AI, the involvement of AI-related issues will continue. We will look forward to um, Yuval's uh, future work on, on thinking about the, this type of problem. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.